Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some magi from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the Magi, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Well, we're still getting ready. And the reason I have that is um, for several things. One, we are still in the Christmas season. We are in the days of Christmas now. Actually, the 12 days of Christmas, that's the days following Christmas, even though I know in most of society, December 26th, everything gets uh, put away and, and the music is stopped and, and I don't know what the, the... Now they're just clearing out all the Christmas stuff at the stores, I suppose. Um, but as, as I've talked about last Sunday and, and on Christmas, really what, what Christmas marks is is something much more than the birth of a child. It marks the, the entering of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God into um, our time, into our world. And, and really what Matthew wants us to know here in the Gospel of Matthew is what we're getting ready for is the coming kingdom of God. So we're going to hear a lot about that in the, in the coming Sundays uh, as we're reading through Matthew. And so we're getting ready. Um, and and. Getting ready for something, though, you have to know what it is. Uh, and sometimes, though, context makes all the difference. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the context of what's going on and different points of view from the people involved in this familiar story we just read. Uh, and, and to just kind of get our brains working a little bit this morning, um, I'm going to have us look at a statement on the screen. And, and on that... I'm just wondering what your first thoughts are when you see this statement. It's going to rain. Tell me, what's your first thought? It's going to freeze. It's, going to freeze. it's winter. It rains. It gets icy. Yes. Um, what, if you're, uh, what if you're a farmer and it's July and it hasn't rained in a month? It's going to rain. Yeah. Think of that. Multiply that. If you're a farmer in East Africa or anybody in East Africa has rained in three years, this, this would be the greatest blessing you could hope for. What if you're going to the state fair? Not so good. Everything depends, if you're, everything depends on the context of the statement. It's going to rain. If you're a farmer, it's July, it hasn't rained in a month, good news. If it's planting season... Not so good news if you can't get into your wet field. So it all depends on the context. It's the same. The key statement here, where is the newborn king? Whether you see that as good news or bad news depends on your point of view. Um, it was in the news a few months ago, the, the new royal baby over in England, everybody celebrating. Um, so... When the, when the Magi come to Herod and say, where's the newborn king? Who sees that as good news and who sees that as a bad news depends on their point of view. Uh, and so that's what I want to talk a little bit about the different people involved and their point of views on this statement. Um, the first one is the Magi's point of view. 
Uh, and now, I just got to say a little bit about the star, the light in the sky that guides them. If you ever meet anyone who says, I can tell you definitively what that light was, you don't even have to listen to anything else they say. Because all we know about that light is what it did, what the Bible tells us it did. It led the wise men to Jesus. That was what the light did. <clears throat> and just real briefly, there are three kind of basic ideas on what that light might have been. It might have been a natural phenomenon. Uh, uh, there was about that time Saturn and Jupiter lined up. And in the thinking of the day, Jupiter represented royalty. Saturn represented the Hebrew people. So they say here they're converging. It would be very bright in the sky. Um, could have been like a supernova, a comet, something like that that guided them. Uh, it could have been um, a supernatural light God put in the sky just specifically for the purpose of leading these wise men. <clears throat> or it could have been an angel. Just like when the Israelites were in the wilderness, an angel led them, a pillar of fire by uh, night and a pillar of cloud by day could have led them. God, as creator of the universe, could certainly use any of these uh, things to get it accomplished. And, to, and what people think it is, each individual person says a lot more about them and kind of where they're at than anything else. And I'll just say, for me, the idea that this was possibly, say, like a supernova, to me, that's more impressive. You know, God created the universe. He put a light in the sky anytime he wants. But that God could have caused a supernova to explode maybe 10,000 years before, so at that moment it would appear in the skies and lead the wise men, that's some pretty impressive long-term planning on God's part. So that, that idea impresses me. But the main thing is what it did. It led the wise men. It led the magi. Now for them to recognize this light in the sky and think to themselves, we've got to go to Jerusalem to see this newborn king, that's a whole other mystery. Um, and, and, and so these magi, what they, were, they weren't kings like we sing, we three kings of Orinar. They weren't kings and there weren't three. Well, there might have been three, but we don't know. It doesn't say. It says there were three gifts. Um, there's lots of traditions. Twelve and fifteen are also traditions I've read. Seven. I've read lots of different things in ancient times. We've pretty much settled on three in the modern era. But in the past, people just threw numbers out that they liked. Uh, because it doesn't say. But we know what the Magi were. The Magi were the ancient equivalent to a modern think tank. You know, they have these groups... Uh, mostly in Washington, D.C., where they sit around and think about stuff and, and then advise the government with no responsibility, saying, we thought about this, this is what you should do. That's kind of what the Magi were. They were experts in religion. They were experts in science, which in those days were overlapped quite a bit. They were experts in military strategy. They were experts in, in social issues and political issues. And they would study an issue and advise the king of Persia on what to do. Uh, so they, they were advisors to the king. And, and, and so that's what they were. Uh, religiously, they were probably what was what would be called Zoroastrian, which they combined all these things of science and superstition and, and studying the stars, and they combined it all together. Um, and so really, they are government officials for the government of Persia. And they had it in their belief system that a ruler would come out of Judea. This, this, uh, the, um, at the time of Jesus, the idea the Jews were all waiting for a Messiah to come. These Messiahs, really, people saying, I'm the Messiah, they were a dime a dozen at the time of Jesus. But it wasn't just the Jews. The, the people in, in Persia had this idea, too, that some great ruler was going to come out of Judea and lead the people. And it wasn't just the Persians. I'm going to show you something written by a guy who was a Roman politician. And when he retired, he wrote a, a book called The Lives of the Twelve Caesars. It's sort of his memoir of what happened in the Roman government while he was worked there. And he lived, uh, he wrote this about 80 years after Jesus lived. He was not a Christian. He didn't like Christians. He wasn't a Jew. He didn't like the Jews. He was a Roman, practiced it worked for the Roman government, practiced Roman religions. But this is what he wrote. A firm persuasion had long prevailed through all the East 
that it was fated for the empire of the world at that time to devolve on someone who should go forth from Judah or Judea. Now he goes on to say how the Jews in their, in their self-importance arrogance thought this person coming out of Judea would be a Jew and so they rose to rebellion and of course then we crushed them like the nobodies they really are. He said this person, actually he said this prophecy was fulfilled by a Roman general who went to Judea, made a name for himself militarily and then came back and was a ruler in Rome because of course Rome is the empire of the world from his perspective. But this idea that a ruler is coming out of Judea was not just a Jewish idea. It was all over. It was all over the place. And so these magi, they see, here's the star. It tells us, our, our traditions, our religion tells us, this is ta the time that this great person, that the empires of the world will stand on their shoulders. This is their time. And so they make a 900-mile trip from Persia to Jerusalem. 900 miles on camel. I recently drove just over 900 miles. It's not fun to drive, let alone how many months it would take on a caravan of camels. Um, so that's one perspective. Now the other perspective would be Herod's point of view. Now Herod's point of view, this is not a good thing because Herod is the king but he's a pretender to the throne. He is not of the line of David. First thing Matthew tells us, Jesus is of the line of David. Herod's not of the line of David. Herod is king of, of, of Judea because the Roman Empire says he is king of Judea. And, and those, of those, those of you here who are old enough to remember, think of what happened in Eastern Europe when the Soviet Union never, no longer kept those governments in power. None of them, they all fell down. Some of them in a matter of hours or days. That that in those you know in Poland and Romania and those countries, they were all those governments were only in power because the Soviet Union said they were power. The moment the Soviet Union did not have the threat of force anymore to say those governments are in power, they lost power. Herod is only the king of Judea because the Roman military says he's the king of Judea. Now it gets much more complicated for Herod though because the only organized resistance against the Roman government was Persia. Rome never conquered Persia. They, they were fighting in other places, but it wasn't organized. It was, it was just helter-skelter fighting. They were, the Roman military was terrified of an invasion from Persia because it was the only military that they had met in battle and never defeated. And so here come these magi, official employees of the Persian government. And it's not like in the movies when these three guys show up, show up on camels. They would have traveled with a small army because they're traveling 900 miles through hostile territory. They would have showed up in Jerusalem with a small army saying, we're here to see the new king because we like him. We want to be, we want to worship the new king. We want to be part of the new king. And there is Herod saying, well, this is not good. If a legitimate king rises up and the enemy of the people who keep me in power want to side with this legitimate king, my future does not look good. Now, there is, those are the two opposing points of view of what's going on here in this story. Of course, there's another point of view. Everybody here, the Magi and, and Herod, they're seeing things from a human point of view, from a geopolitical point of view. They're limited in the scope of their understanding. But the other point of view is God's point of view of what's going on here. And we see with God's point of view, what's going on here is not some uh, geopolitical game of chess. It's much bigger than that. We, we tend to think that, that the things that we do as people are the, are the most important things in the world and are the the, the be-all and end-all of, of things in history, but we discover here they're really not. Because um, God's point of view is, I created you in my image. We were created in God's image. That, that that mold of that image was broken in the fall through sin. And so now God is using this birth of Jesus to bring about the restoration, to bring about the repairing of that broken 
uh, of us being broken. Uh, and, and, and so the repair is coming about. So we see it really has nothing to do with geopolitical gamemanship here at all. It has everything to do with restoring God's, the, the relationship between God the Creator and His creation. It has everything to do with, with restoring the, the relationship between specifically God our Creator and those that were created in His image. Because unfortunately, uh, when those created in God's image, when that relationship with God is broken, it affected all of creation. It wasn't just our relationship with God. It affected all of creation. And to repair all of creation, God has to repair the relationship between Himself and those created in His image. And so we see this is, this is um, what God is up to here in the birth of Jesus. Now whether they knew it or not, these, these magi uh, brought gifts that represented what God was up to. I, I don't know what, I, I, to the best of my knowledge, they're just bringing really great gifts fit for a king. But if we look at these, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh, um, what we see is some, some pretty clear uh, representation going on here. That, that the gold, uh, representing Jesus as king, gold is what kings made coins out of. And they put their imprint, uh, you know, remember Jesus said, bring me a coin whose, whose likeness is on the coin? Well, Caesar in that case, the, the king put their picture on the coin to remind everybody Every time they pull out a coin, it reminded them who's in charge. So Jesus as the king. Uh, frankincense was the only incense that was allowed to be used in the temple on the altar for burning sacrifice. So anytime in the Bible it talks about a sweet-smelling sacrifice or, or a, a sacrifice of incense or perfume or anything like that, it's talking about frankincense. Uh, and, and so frankincense representing Jesus as God, the, the Son of God, because that's the only, the only incense uh, fit for God. And the last one, myrrh, they would actually pack myrrh into the wrappings when they wrapped a dead body uh, to cover up the smell, the, the aroma of the myrrh. And so we see here in these gifts what God is really up to, that Jesus comes as the legitimate king, not the king of Judea, but the king of creation, he, he is legitimate in that role because he's the son of God. And that because he's the legitimate king of creation and he's the son of God, he will become the sacrifice that becomes the foundation for repairing our relationship between, uh, between us and God. Now, there's, there's one more point of view that needs to be taken into account here. And, and we, had, we had the Magi's point of view that, that this... Uh, this ruler that the empire of the world would stand up, rest upon his shoulders, uh, they say that's what they're seeing here. We have Herod, who sees Jesus as a threat to his power. Uh, and we see God's point of view of what's really going on here, what God, what God is doing here. Uh, and so in light of all that, we have one more point of view, and that's the human point of view. That's our point of view, what, what is going on for us. And... Um, how we react to this news that the newborn king has come, how we react to that uh, speaks volumes about us and what God is up to. And so I want to look at, in the Bible, we have those, the first people, the first human point of view, what we talked about already, the wise men. They come and they worship the king, uh, Jesus as the king of the Jews and they bring him these gifts. Now there's one other time in the Gospel of Matthew that Matthew wrote, wrote down that phrase, the king of the Jews. The one other time that he did that is at the end of the story. When the soldiers weave a, a crown of thorns and place it on Jesus' head and mock him and say, I'll say hail, king of the Jews. It's the only time these phrases, this phrase is used about Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew is doing that intentionally, saying, here on the one point, on the one hand, we have these magi, these foreigners, representatives of a foreign government uh, that represent a foreign religion, and they're coming and saying, this is the king. We've come 900 miles to see the king. 
On the, at the end of the story, we have these Roman soldiers who represent the government, who keep the Jewish authorities in authority and keep Herod in, in power. And they mock him as the king of the Jews, treat him with contempt, beat him, and in the end, nail him to a cross so he'll die. And, and, we, and we see from, from, the, from the human point of view how we respond to this story uh, is then of critical importance. And I, I'm not going to sit here and, you know, how do you decide today we're Lutherans? We, you know, for better or for worse, that's kind of not how we talk. But, but really, when we examine our own lives, uh, there's, a third, there's a third reaction to all of this. That's nothing. And, and I think that's where too many people are at, that, that for them the birth of Jesus becomes... Uh, just a secular holiday. I heard this was kind of a depressing poll I heard recently. Uh, this is a brand new poll I th that, that Gallup did. That 25% of Americans view Christmas as strictly a secular holiday. Now that means 75% see it as a, as a religious holiday. The problem is 90-some percent of Americans say I'm a Christian. Which means over 20% of Christians see Christmas as a secular holiday. I don't have a problem with someone who's not a Christian saying Christmas is a secular holiday. I, I get a little nervous when Christians start to say that Christmas, the birth of Jesus, the coming of the kingdom of God into the world is a secular holiday. Because, because the, the relationship between God and the world fundamentally changed when Jesus was born because he is God among us. Emmanuel, God among us. And that's another thing. The only time in the whole Bible Jesus is called Emmanuel is in that announcement of his birth, that his birth represents God among us. That it is, not just represents, but it is God among us. God has is, God is, um, come pleased to dwell, as we, we say in the hymn, that he's pleased to dwell among us. Uh, and, and so, as Christians, uh, we just have to see, this is a turning point in history. This is, this is where the people stopped waiting for the kingdom of God and started encountering the kingdom of God. And that's what we're going to see and that's what we're going to try and, and, and come to some understanding of over in the coming Sundays is what does it mean when we encounter the kingdom of God in our lives right here and right now? What does it mean for us to live in a time when the Bible tells us the kingdom of God has already arrived? It's not something we're, we're, we're waiting for it to finish arriving, but the Bible tells us it's already arrived, that we live in the presence of the kingdom of God today, here and now. That's what we're going to be looking at. What are the implications of that for our lives? So let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks this day for these magi, these, um, these mysterious men who came from far away, to worship Jesus as the newborn king. Uh, that, that in their coming, that he is revealed as who he truly is. That he's revealed as the legitimate king of all creation. He's revealed as your son in human flesh. And he's revealed as the sacrifice that saves us from our sins. We pray, Lord, you will, you will help us. Uh, give us hearts and minds that ponder this uh, in, in, the, in the week to come. Just what does it mean that Jesus is, is our king, uh, that he is our God in flesh, and that he is, that is our means of being redeemed and forgiven and rejoined with you. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.